Hi, I'm Sydney Boykins. And I'm Justice. And our case is about a 50-year-old man with fatigue, weight loss, joint pain, and knee swelling. Okay. Hello, Mr. Michaels. What brings you to the hospital this morning? Um, hello, doctor. I've uh, had this pain in my back uh, for almost two years now. Um, and I've had it checked out at a hospital. They okay. told me I had fluid in my spine or something. And uh, they told me I had to come see you for further diagnostic procedures. And uh, I fell 11 months ago and wow. that just worsened the pain. Okay, so um, is this a constant pain or does it come and go? Um, it's, a, it's an on and off pain, sort of. Uh, normally when I'm resting, I can feel the pain. But when I do some physical activity or when I'm walking around, it, it goes away. Okay, um, do you mind showing me where this pain is? Uh, I so think uh, on my upper back, a little lower. The, here? Yeah, yeah. yeah here, right okay. There. Yeah. Okay, and um, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate your pain right now? I would say about a 5 or a 6. 5, okay. 6. Yeah. So um, are you taking any medication for this pain right now? Um, yeah, I'm going to... Uh, quite a number of medications right now, and uh, I've had this uh, chiropractic treatment done on my spine where they bend your body in like weird angles and positions. It, it, it didn't help. It did not help? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, your medical history records show here that you do have fluid in your spine, and I suspect there's a relationship between that and your back pain. So um, before I send you out for another MRI, do you mind telling me, do you have any pain or um, numbness in your arms or your legs? Actually, the, there's uh, some numbness in my toes, um, more on the left foot, and I, I have a swelling on my knee. Okay, um, how long has that been going on for? Like I said, it's, it's been on and off for like two years almost now. Two years, okay. Um, so your medical records state you do have pain of the thoracic and lumbosacral spine. What I'm going to do is send you in for another MRI just to confirm that what we actually have here is a spinal problem. Um, this is something we should take care of right away, especially since you mentioned uh, numbness in your feet. Okay. So this is the result of the MRI for Mr. Michaels. Um, we found that the space between the 10th and 11th thoracic vertebral bodies are filled with fluid. And this might explain his back pain and the other pains that he has been having. Uh, also, we have observed uh, ossification uh, in his T12, uh, L1 discs, and the L1 and L2 spaces. So T12, L1, L1, L2 are just uh, letter number combinations to indicate specific areas in the spine and uh, th these images along with the symptoms that Mr. Michaels uh, presented helped us to come to a conclusion about our diagnosis. So there are a number of diagnoses we considered based off of our results but initially we considered two. Um, the first is discitis osteomyelitis which can be defined as inflammation that develops between the intervertebral discs of the spine and swelling puts pressure on these discs, which causes pain. And then the second condition we considered was a fracture with pseudoarthrosis, um, which is a bone fracture that can't be mended without intervention because the body perceives the fractures as independent bones. Uh, so for our differential diagnosis, we had three categories of uh, diseases that we thought might have caused uh, all these uh, symptoms. So first we, we had uh, the possibility of infection, the second one was cancer, and the last one was inflammatory back pain. And um, so for the first condition, um, we considered infection, which is actually more common in patients with immunodeficiencies such as HIV, which our patient did not have. Um, but another thing we were looking at was the C reactive protein level, which should show up as abnormal in the case of infection. However, this level was only minimally elevated in our patient so we were able to rule out infection as the cause. And so if you look at this, you can see that the normal CRP is 1.0 milligram per liter. Um, our patient had 8.5, which, um, which is still high, but we weren't that concerned with it. Uh, so the second possible cause uh, of his uh, disguidance we thought was uh, lung cancer. That was, that was our biggest concern. 
but uh, the symptoms that uh, Mr. Michaels uh, presented made it highly unlikely for uh, uh, them to be caused by a lung cancer. Additionally, we did not find any abnormal pulmonary fi uh, findings in, uh, in his systems and uh, at his age, it would be very unlikely that he had a primary uh, spinal cancer. And so finally, we consider inflammatory back pain as a cause because it typically goes away with exercise, which is consistent with what Mr. Michaels reported. Um, so there are two types we looked at, and the first is sarcoidosis, which is a rare disease that causes symptoms consistent with our patients. Um, however, we had no pulmonary findings with Mr. Michaels, no mass lesions, so we ruled that out. Uh, the second disease uh, we considered was uh, spondyloarthropathy, and this is basically a family of diseases with common traits, and they particularly affect the joints of the spine. Uh, we first thought uh, psoriatic arthritis was the cause, but we immediately ruled that out because uh, this type of disease has an asymmetric pattern of sacroiliitis, which is very different from the multi-level uh, discitis that the patient was shown. And uh, we finally came to the conclusion that our patient had uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which is an inflammation uh, of the spinal joints, uh, which uh, also includes new bone formation on the joints of the spine. So the interesting thing about this diagnosis is that most patients with AS are actually much younger than Mr. Michaels. Um, however, his incident occurred years ago, so we think this is why um, we're just now finding the root of the cause. And um, another component is that most people that have AS have the gene HLA-B27, which our patient doesn't have, which we think would lead um, physicians to first look away from AS as a potential cause. Uh, and uh, with all this information, uh, we believe the question to ask is, why then would we uh, diagnose this patient with ankylosing spondylitis when all the information seems to be pointing away from uh, the possible causes of uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. For example, we're talking about his C-reactive protein levels being normal and he tested negative for the gene that you normally have to have to have this uh, type of disease. Well, the one characteristic feature of ankylosing spondylitis is when uh, a person has it, they have this fluctuating level uh, of C-reactive protein, and we believe that at the point that Mr. Michael came to see us, it was at the stage of uh, remission of this disease where the uh, C-reactive protein levels were quite at a minimally elevated but significantly low. And in this image, uh, we can see massive erosion of the spine and uh, the formation of syndesmophytes, which are basically new bone formation on the spinal joints. Um, so another thing with ankylosing spondylitis, the new bone that forms over the joint um, are hard and typically brittle and not very strong. So as far as treatment goes, we looked at two things. The first was targeting the inflammatory pathway um, that controls joint stiffness and weakness of bone. Um, cytokine inhibitors are helpful even though we don't know yet whether or not they aid in formation of new fragile bone. And then the second approach was um, surgically stabilizing the spine. Uh, so one thing that makes uh, ankylosing spondylitis a unique type of uh, spondyloarthropathy is the pathway which it takes. It uh, basically takes two pathways. So the first one is the TNF pathway. And this is quite a complex set of cell signaling mechanisms. But simply put, it's just uh, a high presence of uh, tumor necrosis factors in the body which cause a speedy maturation of osteoclasts. And osteoclasts are these cells that uh, cause bone resorption or bone erosion that we saw in uh, Mr. Michael's spine uh, image. And the other pathway is the WNT pathway, which basically, or simply put, is a pathway which involves the inhibition of uh, DECOF proteins. And this, these DECOF proteins uh, stop the formation of 
new bone in wrong places. Wrong places meaning joints, uh, per specifically in this case, the spinal joints uh, in Mr. Michael's uh, spine. Okay, so several days after the successful um, surgical procedure, our patient did develop third degree heart block. Um, we gave him a dual chamber pacemaker and this solved the problem, but we still had the question of why this heart block occurred. Um, so we believe it could be attributed to a number of factors, including AS itself because it causes inflammation, and we thought there was a possibility that this inflammation spread to his heart. Um, the second possibility we considered was his moderate alcohol use in combination with uh, prescription drugs. So these are just a few examples of drugs that he was taking and um, how they can cause circulatory collapse. Um, and again, full list of medications um, combined <coughs> with alcohol leads to a negative result for his heart. Uh, so to stabilize Mr. Michael's spine, a uh, simple spinal fusion surgery uh, was uh, done on his spine. Uh, and right now we are considering uh, microsurgery, which is uh, simply just the same surgery with the help of microscopes. So the advantage of microsurgery is uh, you basically have smaller incisions, which means uh, less bleeding of the patients and uh, more quick recovery of the patients. And finally, another treatment approach we considered was um, a more holistic approach. So we focused on physical therapy, um, yoga, deep breathing for the rib cage, and then relieving oneself of physical and emotional stress. And then another component we looked into was diet. So omega-3s are fats that reduce inflammation. And then we also looked at whole grains, which are good for the heart. Um, and then in addition, Mr. Michael survived. He was fine after the um, heart procedure. And Yeah. How many layers was the spinal fusion? How many disc layers was it? Uh, it was at most three. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so you were talking about the two pathways. Uh, there was the TNF alpha and the IL six stimulation of the osteoclasts, which are dissolving bone. But uh, we also saw those bone spurs forming. You talked about the wind pathway. Was the wind pathway? It's as osteoblasts that are setting down new bone. Is, is that wind path, the aberrant wind pathway in osteoblasts? That's where they're seeing it, or what, what's? Yeah, it's 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 a kind of weird way that ankylosing spondylitis works because normally with uh, rheumatoid uh, arthritis you get only the osteoclast activity, but with uh, ankylosing spondylitis you have both the osteoblast working to build bone on the joints, but in some uh, areas of the spine, you have the osteoclast uh, eroding the bone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And both of those actions are related to the, uh, the HL, what was it, B27? B27G. Yeah. Although sometimes you do need uh, an uh, external source to, to, to have ankylosing spondylitis, uh -huh. uh, it, it's just like one of the ways in which you can have ankylosing spondylitis apart from the gene factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just trying to understand it because the osteoblasts, as, and you're, I'm sure you remember, osteoblasts and osteoclasts are two totally different uh, cell origins. Mm -hmm. And having a single gene linked to that seems there's more I want to know. But uh, is there anything else? Okay, well, one more round.